Welcome back to Coding Shorts. I'm Sean Wildermuth. Before we get started, I wanted to put in a short plug. I'm going to be doing an online one-day workshop on Aspire on June 12th. You'll see a little link on the bottom of the page if you're interested in signing up. Early bird pricing is still available. On to the rest of the video. Today I want to continue talking about .NET Aspire. We're going to be talking about databases and connection strings. Let's get started. So we're back in the same project we looked at last time. You can see we have that API project and you can go up to the video and link here if you didn't watch the last one and you wanna find out how we actually got here. But effectively there's two parts. There's an API and there's a view app that we can run. But right now we only have one .NET project. And so this is working fine, right? The API project knows about the data store and the view app doesn't need to know about that data store because it's just communicating with that API. But as we add new projects here, we might be adding other APIs to do different things or different parts of an application to accomplish different tasks. We may need to be able to share that information. Right now, inside of my API project, I just have a connection string here pointing to a database that I created for the project. So nothing absolutely has to happen there. But one of the things we can do, let me go ahead and set our host as the startup project, is I might wanna set some settings here and pass them along. So we look at that app settings in our project. There's not gonna be a whole lot here, but let's go ahead and just say some value, hello world, just some value in app settings. And I wanna be able to pass that along. Because I wanna pass some distributed value, I'm just gonna add it here after we added project with environment. And here I'm gonna give it a name and I'll call it title message and then i'll just get it from configuration so builder dot configuration dot get value and it's going to be a string and i'm just going to tell it to go ahead and get some value at this api level we can pass these along as environment variables to the api project i could also do the same thing and pass them to the npm app so this should cover any sort of configuration you want if we run this well, let's take a look at that api you can see in the environment variables there's going to be title message. And if we look at it, hello world, right? And so this gives you the ability to push down any configuration to any specific part that you want. And in particular, when I want to share something like a connection string, I could actually pass into my API project this show money database. So how am I going to actually do that? I'm going to say connection strings shoe money db. Again, that's going to match the name that the API project uses so that I could override it. So I could use for development time just one, but then set this environment variable in. And so I'm just going to use the builder.configuration.get connection string, and I'm going to give it shoe money db. Now, the important thing to think about is this is the configuration for our host project. So it's expecting there to be a connection string in here. This might be a whole different connection string. It won't be in this case because I don't have it in two places, but this way, this will be the connection string setting for across the different applications, not just your application. Then when we look at our API project, we should see that there's now an environment variable for our connection string. And there it is, right? It's being passed in. And so importantly in the API project, since it's just calling get connection string, it's actually gonna get the connection string that is bound to the same name here. Because again, that environment variable is gonna replace it. The only thing you need to be a little careful about is that the colon syntax for environment variable specifically doesn't work the same way on Linux. So it's often safer to use two underscores, which is valid on Windows and Linux to do the same thing. So if we go and look, you can see it still works, right? You might think, oh, that's kind of an odd way to do it where you're just using environment variables. And this could be used for a bunch of things that aren't about entity framework or getting at databases. What we can actually do is say var connection string builder add connection string. What is that going to be? That's just going to be a name that it's expecting in the configuration for a connection string, just like we were getting it from the configuration. And then instead of having to think about what those environment variables are, we can actually just say with reference to our connection string. And that will have the same effect. This will pass in that connection string. And again, if we look at the API project, we'll see it's doing the identical thing, right? It's grabbing that connection string and putting it in for us so it'll just be usable. And so this way, instead of having to read it directly from configuration, it's gonna to try to do the right thing for you in every case. So while we can pass in the connection string that way, another way we can do this is to actually pass a SQL server in. We can do this with add builder, add SQL server. And you notice it's complaining because we actually need a new NuGet package called aspire.hosting. 
If you just return that, it'll return all the different hosts you can see that are supported. And what we're looking for is the SQL Server one right there. I'm going to go ahead and install the 8 version like you've seen in the last video. If you've used an earlier version of Aspire, you might notice that we're needing to add more assemblies. That's because they've broken out, so the default package is a little smaller. But you're going to tend to see a lot of these things change over time. Go back to our add server. We can now give it a server name, and I'm just going to call it the server for lack of a better name. And I'm going to also say add a database to that, and we can use the same name, show money DB. Right now, this has to be the same database name you had before. A little unclear why, but it does work once you are using the same name as you had for your connection string. And let's comment that out. And here we're going to say just use the SQL Server instead. So how does this work? I'm saying add the SQL Server. And this is not only saying create a reference to my project for the SQL Server, but actually to add a SQL Server to our project. And that's going to be a container that contains SQL Server and can host a database. But that requires us to make one small change here in our original project where we're using the add db context and getting the connection string. That is now out. And instead of it, we're going to actually say builder.add SQL Server db context, shoe context, right? Now, again, this is complaining because yet again, we're going to need another package. We search for Aspire Entity Framework. We're going to say Aspire for SQL Server. And you can see there's other versions like for Postgres, for MySQL, for Oracle, and then for Cosmos. Of course, Oracle has to be different and have their naming different. Let's go ahead and bring down that 8 version since we're using the 8 SDK, not the 9. I'm only using the 8 SDK because I wanted the fewest moving pieces. So it's finding it now, but it wants a name. What is this name? It's going to be show money DB. Now this is an important distinction. This is going to be the name of the database, not of the server. So let's go ahead and run this. We can now see in the dashboard here, we have the container that is the server or the SQL server. And it says what the SQL server image it's actually using. It's running under Linux, it's not running under Windows. And then we have the SQL server itself. We have the SQL server database resource, which is actually that shoe money DB. And if we look at our API here, we'll see that we have a connection string and this is how they're connecting those together. They're computing this for you. And where's the server? There right? It's a SQL Server instance that we can get at because it's in right here in our Docker desktop. Here's that server that it fired up for us and we went ahead and added data into it. Obviously, if you need your data to be persistent, there's some other pieces to worry about there. But let's go ahead and take this server before we've even run it to see if it works. And let's just look at it. And this works about half the time. So I'm going to say that's going to be my server. I'm going to use SQL Server authentication because right now Windows into the Linux isn't automated. And ultimately, you're probably going to be customizing this resource to not be just off the shelf SQL. There may be some other things you do to it, but for now, this should be good enough. And the last thing we want to look at is if we look at the details for the SQL Server itself, we'll actually see what the generated password for the SQL Server is. So I'm just going to copy that. Go back to Visual Studio. Make sure we say trust certificate true. And there it is. Now what's in the SQL Server? Database. This should all look familiar. It's the same database we had before. And just to make sure that we're seeing the same data, I'm going to look at our orders table. There's nothing there. So let's go ahead and launch our UI. And I have a pre-filled in basket that has a couple of shoes in it. So let's go over there. That looks OK. Those are pre-filled in for me just so I can make this demo quick. Same for all my other code here. I'm going to go ahead and submit my order. It's going to show the orders disappeared. It should be redirecting there, but that's something I'll fix later. Now, what happens if we refresh this? There's our new order, right? Inside of the SQL Server, not inside of our local DB. And so this really comes down to how you want to use it. I'm used to in development scenarios of always using local DB and such, but if I'm ultimately going to be moving to a SQL Server in a container, I have my options of how I want to really do this, how much control you want, or you want to just let the framework of Aspire help you out by doing all the hard work of creating and launching a container for you. In a few weeks, I'm going to be covering the deployment story, which I think is important here, and how these settings are going to be end up in some scripts to how you want to deploy it, whether that's on Azure or AWS or someplace else, or even in-house. And those stories, I think, are going to be important for you to see how it's starting to make the development experience better, even though I may have said wrongly in the last video, but I've been corrected, that this dashboard is something that you could use actually in production, just it's not a replacement for a real dashboard that talks about logs 
logs and traces and all that other stuff, the, all of the telemetry you're going to need for an application like this. So if you got this far, I appreciate you liking and subscribing. That always helps. Go ahead and share this video if you know some other people that are interested in Aspire. And speaking of Aspire, I'm going to mention again, I have a one-day course. It's going to be held online, and it's one day of .NET Aspire, getting you sort of souped and nuts through the whole thing. It's all online, four modules. You can see the link down here to take a look at the outline, maybe pitch it to your boss, and get your ticket. Early bird pricing is still available, so check it out if you're interested in something longer than these little videos. Well, thanks for joining me. I'm Sean Wildemuth for Coding Shorts. I'll see you next time.